Okay. Uh, it's uh, 1234 p.m. in Los Angeles. It's uh, 334 p.m. in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania on Wednesday, the 9th of January, 2013. I'm Mark Strassman, reporter with Utopia News. I'm about to talk to uh, Dalen Leach, who's a P Pennsylvania State Senator representing District 17. Welcome to Utopia News. It's good to be with you, Mark. Tell us about your two cannabis bills. Well, uh, last session I introduced a medical marijuana bill, largely uh, modeled on the Montana bill. Uh, however, this session, this week actually, I'm introducing a full legalization bill, which will sort of make the medical marijuana bill uh, mute in, moot in the sense that you could buy marijuana for any purpose, medical, recreational, or whatever. So uh, if, we're, if we manage to pass this, uh, then we won't need the medical marijuana bill. What are the prospects of passing the bill? Well, what I say to people is short term it's difficult, long term it's inevitable. There are two things driving the inevitability of this. Number one is demographics. Uh, the younger you are, the more likely you are to support full legalization. So as I say, every day a supporter of my bill is born and an opponent goes to heaven. Um, over time, that is a, a demographic that's going to just make this a non-issue. The other thing is exposure. As more states do this, either fully, like Washington and Colorado, or de facto, like California, or even the city of Philadelphia, where they're no longer prosecuting uh, small uh, marijuana cases. People will see that this doesn't lead to any collapse of Western civilization. There are no adverse effects. The only thing it leads to is fewer people being put in prison, fewer young lives destroyed, hundreds of millions of dollars saved in prosecuting and incarcerating and monitoring people for smoking a plant that makes them feel giddy. Plus, uh, the, the infusion of hundreds of millions of dollars into the state treasury of tax money from a product which will be safe, regulated, taxed, um, and, and uh, will no longer be uh, a crime. Uh, so the effects will all be good. People will see that. And over time, the opposition to this, like the opposition to other things where there's, there's no good argument against it, melts away. What kind of re reaction have you been getting from the uh, media and the public for your uh, proposed uh, legislation? <coughs> I've gotten a great reaction from the public, and I got to tell you, I, I introduce uh, uh, one of my uh, one of the things I like to do as a senator is introduce very controversial legislation. I'm probably the only senator who likes to do that. Um, I have a weird genetic mutation which causes me to enjoy controversy. So. I've introduced a lot of controversial legislation, eliminating the death penalty, uh, legalizing same-sex marriage, I could go on and on. Um, uh, and there's usually a predictable breakdown in terms of the public reaction, uh, whether it's uh, partisan lines or whether it's age or religious lines. Uh, this is completely different. I have people, um, and the, the response has been well over 95% positive. And what's interesting is people always feel like they have to give me their their uh, counterintuitive credentials. They have to say, I don't smoke marijuana, but I support your bill, or I'm 78 years old, or I'm a police officer, or whatever it is. And so I am getting support for this all across uh, every demographic. It's not divided by political party or age or anything. There is uh, a few people who've opposed to it, uh, but you know, it's very few. I think this is an issue that's reached a tipping point and that uh, uh, it's an issue whose time has come and uh, there will be a few people fighting a rear guard action, uh, but at the end of the day, the arguments are so weak, the science is so unsupportive of their position, that, they're, that, that, that I don't think they're going to be able to sustain their arguments for long. Well, with that much public support, why can't the legislature pass it? Because the legislature, uh, there's a disconnect on not only this issue, but a whole variety of issues between the legislature um, and the public. And keep in mind, it's not that you can't speak of the legislature as a monolith. There are, there are uh, all different types of legislators here, uh, and uh, because of a couple, because of the 2010 election, because of recent developments which transcend this issue, uh, a number of legislator, legislator, legislators here are just very ideological, and they're much more wed to their ideology than they are to public opinion. So to them, uh, you know, I mean, if you're a Tea Party person, uh, for some reason, you know, not all of them, but some of them, marijuana is just bad. And when you say why, they're like, but it's bad. It's like the old South Park episode where the guy kept repeating, marijuana is bad, uh, you know, without any real reason for it. Um, and then when you do push them, for example, our governor, our governor is a very ideological guy. Um, it really doesn't give a lot of thought to these issues and death. Um, 
And when asked why he opposed this, because he said he did, he said, well, marijuana is a gateway drug. And that's such lazy thinking because, number one, the science doesn't support that. Over 90% of people who, who smoke marijuana do not use harder drugs ever. And well, well so, so talk about that disconnect. If, if they say the reason it can't be legalized is because it's a gateway drug and it's not a gateway drug, how do people continue to make the argument? Well, I mean, it's like same-sex marriage. You know, if we, if we legalize that, then soon we'll be legalizing marriage with monkeys. Well, of course, no state that has legalized same-sex marriage has legalized interspecies marriage. It's a ridiculous argument. But ridiculous arguments have surprising uh, durability around here because you know why? They're not tied to public opinion. They're not tied to, like, a, an open under, a, an, a willingness to get more facts and change one's mind. Uh, they're, they're tied to ideology. It's more theology. People who have a theological belief, let's say in a religion, are not interested in hearing arguments as to why the God they believe in doesn't really exist. Similarly, uh, you know, if you have a theological or ideological position on an issue, you're not really listening or, or open to arguments or studies or facts about why the, your, your position isn't right. That is a problem not only on marijuana, that is a problem that transcends a whole variety of issues now. However, over time, uh, I think the facts do win out uh, in the face of resistance, and I think that's why I think this bill will pass. Uh, and, you know, people need to be convinced. My job uh, is to convince them. It, it sounds like what Thomas Kuhn wrote about in uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, a paradigm shift, which he argues takes place when new people come in and old people leave. <clears throat> yes, and, and that is the clearest um, uh, reason why this will win. Because again, <clears throat> what I've what I've said to some of my conservative colleagues is, you know, a 60, 70 year old conservative legislature should, legislator should spend some time with a 20 and 30 year old conservative, not a liberal, but a conservative. And what they'll find is these young conservatives don't really care who you marry, and they don't care if you want to get high. And so this battle. And that's the conservatives. So this battle is lost to them. It's only a question of time. And what I'm trying to convince them of, why fight this battle and continue to destroy lives, continue to lose hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for the next five, six, seven years, uh, when we could put this behind us, move on, start reaping the benefits of it, and argue about other things. How would your bill structure the, uh, the, the production and sale of marijuana? Well, I'm not wedded to, I'll tell you what my bill does. Personally, I'm not wedded to any one approach. I'm open to other approaches. But we, the, the approach we chose, Pennsylvania has a very unique uh, system of distributing alcohol. We're one of two states that has state stores. Uh, we have beer distributors that do it. We have, I mean, there's a whole bunch, depending on what you want to buy, there's a whole bunch of different ways to buy it. So I figured the best way to do this initially was to plug into a system that already exists that already is set up to A, check age, because my bill requires you to be 21 to get marijuana. So um, you'd be 21 to get alcohol. There's a system in place to verify age already. There's a system in place to collect taxes. There's a, there's a distribution system in place. So initially, we would start with the state stores and basically anywhere that could sell alcohol could sell marijuana. Uh, uh, down the road, private shops like coffee shops opening up, I certainly have no objection to that. But initially, to get this off the ground, I figure let's let's go the path of least resistance and plug it into a pre-existing system. And where would the uh, production take place, and under what auspices? Well, the, 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 that is a, another uh, subject of uh, discussion. Initially, and again, there's there's initial and long term. Initially, uh, we would have growers in Pennsylvania. Um, now, down the line, uh, w once this becomes more national, once it's it's you know there's I mean, there's already 19 states that have medical marijuana. Uh, there are uh, two states that have full legalization, but another 12 states that have decriminalization in some form. Uh, as that happens, there will become a national network of uh, uh, marijuana that you could buy that will be safe, that will be, um, you know, predictable, and, and we'll be able to plug into it at that time. Keep in mind, that's one of the big advantages of legalization, which is right now, if you, if you want to, if your child wants to buy marijuana, he's got to go, you know, behind the bowling alley from, from, from some guy he doesn't know who's, who's, who's a criminal, who's a, who's a drug dealer, and buy marijuana, which may be laced with PCP, may, may be laced with 
all kinds of other things. He doesn't know the strength of it or the, or, or, or the potency of it. Uh, so he has no idea what he's smoking. Whereas if we had uh, a regulated industry, you would know exactly this has this much THC, this type has this much THC, it's not laced with anything else, it's safe. So, you know, lives would be saved uh, and all kinds of heartache would be saved. And that's just one of the many ancillary benefits of legalizing it. I'm a little intrigued by the image that, uh, the vision that you've presented of interstate cooperation. Are you saying that w once the process has gone a little further that marijuana grown in Colorado could be sold in Washington or Pennsylvania? <coughs> Well, I think inevitably that will be the case. It'll be like wine, you know, but um, th there, there are impediments to that short term. What are they? The, the federal illegality uh, issue is an impediment. Now, President Obama just said to, last week uh, that they have bigger fish to fry. The prosecuting people for small amounts of marijuana is not going to be something the federal government does. So <clears throat> that will enable legalization in terms of use uh, and possession to, to go forward in places like Washington and Colorado and other places. Um, however, transportation across state lines is still tricky, and uh, for that reason, we would start out until, and I think that once, you know, once 26 states, 28 states have legalized it fully, that the federal uh, law is going to atrophy, uh, and, and, and it's going to go away, it's going to be repealed in one form or another. Well, but, are you saying that the, the Controlled Substance Act would be Reschedule to take marijuana off Schedule One. Yeah, yeah. Keep, and keep in mind, Schedule One is the highest schedule. It's, I mean, marijuana is considered, you know, which is one of the worst drugs you can do, which is hilarious, uh, considering uh, the reality of the situation. Uh, you can't overdose on marijuana. You can try, but you're not going to succeed. Uh, you, marijuana is not physically addictive, uh, you know, uh, and yet to treat it like cocaine or, or heroin, heroin or meth. Uh, is, is just preposterous. It's another sign of an irrational policy. Um, marijuana is less dangerous than children's cough syrup, uh, and it's less addictive than chocolate, but we still send people to prison for it, and uh, that's got to stop. Uh, what policy would you like to see the federal government take in terms of banking and uh, uh, the authority and legitimacy of state officials and others participating in the marijuana business in Colorado and Washington? I would like the government, the federal government, to give, you know, we always talk about the, the, the states are the laboratories of democracy. Give Colorado uh, and Washington, and they've been doing this in, uh, for the most part in California and other places, give them room to, <coughs> you know, the, the people of their state have passed the law. Give them room for that law to work. St uh, you know, uh, adopt as much of a laissez-faire attitude as possible on this. And let's, you know, let's reconvene in a year, in two years, in three years. What's happened? You know, in Portugal, Portugal was the first European uh, Union state to fully decriminalize, fully legalize. There's a difference, legalize. Um, and uh, Portugal now has the lowest rate of marijuana use in Europe. So, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's not at all clear uh, that this is going to result in more people. It may very well result in less people using marijuana as sort of the, the, the thrill of doing something that's illegal uh, for young people goes away. Uh, you know, it, it, it'll become more like cigarettes where, you know, yeah, I, I just, I, I, what I'm saying is I think let's give it time. Let's give it a couple years. Let's see the result and let's talk about it. If the result is what I predict it, it will be, then uh, hopefully the federal government will start moving in the direction of adopting a, 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 a laissez-faire attitude towards marijuana and start doing things that it should be doing, uh, like you know, worrying about terrorism and things like that. Um, I interviewed Laurel Dewey yesterday. She's written a book called Betty's Little Basement Garden. She says that there's a stigma attached to marijuana use, that people who use it are brain-dead losers. What can you do to uh, uh, address that stereotype? <laughs> Well, I can tell you it's not true, and, and, and you know, one of the things that's changing minds is when people observe other people. You know, people, older people may have this view in their minds of marijuana users as sort of looking and acting like Jimi Hendrix, uh, but in reality, they, they look and act more like Dick Cheney. They're, they're you know, middle-aged executives uh, at Fortune 500 companies who like to come home and have a joint instead of a glass of wine at night to relax. Um, 
you know, the, 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 the 60s are over. That, that's, not, that's not what's happening anymore. Um, many of the marijuana uh, smokers in society are fully functioning uh, pillars of the community. Um, and uh, th this idea that they're all, you know, uh, uh, you know, in Buffalo Springfield is just not accurate anymore. And we certainly shouldn't be making public policy based on that sort of old wives tale uh, about who smokes marijuana. Uh, what are you doing besides speaking out to organize support for your legislation? <clears throat> well, first of all, one of the things we, the, one of the first important, the most important things we did was introduce the legislation because that's gotten an awful lot of press attention. And one of the, we, we have a pedagogical purpose here. Uh, and, you know, one of the things like on marriage and other issues is to educate people. Uh, because, you know, people have lives and they have one view in their mind of something and they, they don't have cause to think differently about it sometimes. So, uh, number one, we introduced the bill, which got, a lot of, got me a lot of interviews and we're talking about it like I'm talking to you today. Number two, uh, I wrote an editorial where I tried to lay out comprehensively the case for this. It was published today in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, if anyone wants to Google that, uh, and it'll be published in other papers over the next few days all across the state. Um, and I'm using social media as much as possible, Twitter and Facebook, uh, to, uh, I have a, a lot of Facebook followers, a lot of Twitter followers, to send them articles. Is it a gateway drug? Well, here's what the scholarship says. Um, uh, it, it, do, does it uh, you know, cause you to be a stoned out loser or whatever term you use? Well, here's what the studies show. Uh, and they, in turn, tweet it and Facebook it to other people. And so we're, we, are, we are spreading the word in all the, the sort of uh, traditional and modern ways, uh, because edu look, information's our friend here. There is no good rational case. Anything you can say bad about marijuana, anything you can say worse about alcohol. There, there's that's not that's not. We would never, if we were starting society from scratch, and we were deciding, okay, there's two substances which are intoxicating. One causes you to act recklessly and violently, disproportionately. The other causes you to, you know, want to listen to the doors and eat potato chips. Uh, one, uh, you can drink so much in a day that you die. The other, you can't possibly overdose even if you tried. Uh, one is physically addictive. The other is not physically addictive. Um, one, you know, uh, we go through the whole litany and we compare them, uh, alcohol versus uh, uh, marijuana, and no rational society would say, well, marijuana is the thing you should go to jail for. Alcohol we should encourage. No rational society would do that. That makes no sense. And of course, marijuana wasn't prohibited because of some rational decision about its dangers. It was prohibited, if you know anything about the history, in 1937, uh, the Marijuana Tax Act, because of economic interests that didn't want uh, competition uh, that marijuana was providing. Uh, and, and so it's time to get back to a rational policy. And my job is to convince as many people as I can uh, through whatever medium I can find to, that, that this policy is irrational. And we need a rational policy that doesn't destroy lives the way this does. What uh, drives you personally to want to educate people and put forward controversial issues? Because, well, it's, when I was elected to the Senate, I mean, there are some people in the Senate who are like, all, all we should do is recognize the contribution of the woodchuck to Pennsylvania's heritage. They, they don't want controversy. Um, uh, but that's not why I'm here. I mean, uh, to me, I, I'm, a, I'm an issues guy. The reason I ran is not the you know exorbitant salary or the uh, you know the fact that every four years it's someone's job to tell people what a jerk I am when I run for re-election. That, that wasn't what attracted me to the job. What attracted me to the job was to be able to make a difference on issues. I care about these issues, and 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 you know there are very important issues that I don't take a lead role in uh, because other people are willing to. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if someone else was taking, carrying the banner on this, I would let them do it. But this is a critical issue. This is not a fringe issue. It's costing us billions of dollars, billions of dollars that we don't have, number one. It's destroying people's lives, and it's driving people into crime, and it's doing all kinds of horrible things to society. Um, and so, um, you know, if I don't take a lead on that, and I don't see anyone else willing to take a lead on that, it'll never be discussed, it'll never change. If I have any purpose in the Senate, it's to take on issues that other people don't want to take on, um, uh, try to be uh, learn about them, be articulate, as Bob Dylan said, know my song well before I start singing, uh, and then uh, you know try to change your minds. If that's not 
why I'm here, I'm unclear on why I would be here. How long do you want to stay there? Do you want to go uh, somewhere else as an elected official? Uh, th that's possible. Um, you know, I, I mean, you're, you're, you're always looking for a, a, a platform that's more effective. And there's, uh, there, there are some options in the future uh, along those lines. But I will tell you, in order to gain a, uh, another political office, one thing I will not do is become a, just a play it safe wallflower. That's if people want that, there are plenty of people they can vote for for whatever it is. Uh, uh, I, you know, you, the fact that I've introduced this bill and all the other bills I've introduced and supported, uh, it tells you that uh, you know I have one theory of politics, which is you you, you go uh, all out and uh, it, it, you know it, 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 it whatever comes comes, uh, and that's the way I'm going to continue to play it. So you branded yourself as a person who delights in controversy. Yeah, I think delights is fair. Okay. Uh, could you comment a little bit about the uh, uh, gridlock in Washington and what you think might be done to resolve it, or do you think it's not resolved? <clears throat> well, there, there's. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts about this. So I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. There are two things. <clears throat> excuse me. I have a cold, but there's two major causes of gridlock in Washington, in my view. Uh, number one is the 24-hour news cycle, uh, which is causing people to not see the benefit of compromise because there are so many news sources and the, 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 they have to feed the beast with controversy and they make money off of these niche channels. Let me give you an example. When I was a kid, you and I might disagree philosophically, but every night at 6.30 we watch Walter Cronkite. And we, so we have the same set of facts and then we argue about those facts. Well, now, if you watch NBC and you watch Fox News, you have two totally different sets of facts. You don't even have the same facts. And not only that, people who disagree with you don't just disagree, but they're stupid, they're ignorant, they hate America. Uh, it, 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 this is a very destructive force, and I don't see how that changes because uh, that's where the money is to be made. A neutral, sort of calm, uh, fact-based uh, information uh, 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 distribution system is just not profitable anymore. And so that, that's why we're having more and more of this extremist stuff. But the bigger problem, the number one problem in America that's causing the gridlock right now is gerrymandering. And this is the reason. Gerrymandering, for your viewers who don't know, is you know every 10 years we have to redraw the lines for state legislature and Congress based on population shifts. Politicians redraw those lines in a way that's advantageous to their party. In California, um, we, got a, we had a citizens committee to do it. Right, and California is a great a great example of what's great, what, what, what we should be doing. And I have a bill to do similar to what you did in California. Uh, but in Pennsylvania, it's not going anywhere right now. And so what, first of all, what gerrymandering looks like is this. 89,000 people, more people voted for Democratic Congress people in Pennsylvania than Republican. 89,000 more Democrats. But the congressional delegation is 13 Republicans to 5 Democrats. That's what gerrymandering does, number one. And what it does is it makes it so people are in safe seats. They can't possibly lose in November to the other party. So they have no incentive politically to reach across the aisle, to be moderate, to, to, to compromise. That's heresy. The only election they can lose is not a November election because their district is so good, but a primary against someone who's even, and the people who vote in primaries are the most extreme on the left and right. So you can lose a primary to someone who's further to your left if you're a Democrat or to your right if you're a Republican. And what that means is that your political incentive is not to look moderate, not to compromise, not to reach across the aisle, but to be as uncompromising and, and extreme as possible. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, th that has led to a situation where no one's willing to compromise anymore. Um, and uh, people who do are immediately uh, challenged. We had some of the most conservative members in the country lose their seats because of Tea Party opponents because they talked to a Democrat or because they cast one vote that was out of thousands that was heresy. Uh, until those two things change, until we do something about gerrymandering nationwide, and until you know, the 24-hour news cycle goes to a different place where accuracy and learning is more important than just raw team, um, we're right and they're stupid, until that happens, we're never going to be able to make progress uh, in this country. And so, and the way that's going to happen is people have to change. People have to, the, the American citizens have to say, 
I don't care what party you are, if you, if you vote to rig elections through gerrymandering and other ways, voter ID and other ways, if you vote to rig elections, we're not going to vote for you. People have to lose their elections based on this. Then they'll stop doing it. And number two, the American people have to say, I don't want to be fed, uh, you know, I don't want some, to listen to someone tell me that I'm great and that I'm never wrong and that people who disagree with me are morons. I want to hear a, a balanced approach and actually learn the facts. And that's what channel I'm going to turn to. Until they actually turn to that channel and get away from Fox News or whatever, uh, or, or, or extreme talk radio or whatever it is, it's, it's never going to change. I wish I could be more optimistic, but I feel like the vortex is actually leading us further down uh, rather than towards a, 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 a safe harbor, if you will. Yeah, because you've said that the media are constrained by profit and the and that the government and politics are constrained by uh, gerrymandering and extremism. What way do you see the people organizing themselves to overcome these obstacles? Oh, well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, it's, that's a very hard question. I will tell you this. There are spontaneous um, uh, organiz uh, organizations of the people to accomplish certain things. Sadly, they're often what I think are irrelevant and wrong things. You know, <clears throat> there was a, a thing in, in, in Congress in the 80s or early 90s where, you know, congressmen were getting free haircuts and the nation went, you know, there was an uproar in the nation about that. In Pennsylvania, we, uh, the Pennsylvania legislature passed a pay raise for themselves. Oh my God, it was, it was I mean, it was as if, you know, uh, civilization itself had collapsed. The people had you know, uh, rose on on Moss and demanded that people that this pay raise be repealed, and they defeated uh, people in primary elections all across the state who had voted for the pay raise. And there's people with bumper stickers, remember the pay raise, and all. The thing is, though, I mean, the pay raise did not affect their lives at all. I mean, it's it's a rounding error in the budget. It was a symbolic thing. But I'm like, you know, okay, so your legislator is getting a free haircut or getting a pay raise or whatever, you know. That's not, you know, meanwhile, when they vote to steal your democracy through making your vote not count anymore, that's fine. There's no, there's no uproar about that. So I think we have to reprioritize. Another thing I try to do is I, you know, when I think it's appropriate, I criticize the electorate, um, which I'm told is another excellent uh, strategy for political advancement. But, um, you know, the fact is that as, as and I'm one of the citizens, as, as citizens, we have to really start caring about what matters. What matters is, there in Pennsylvania, they, I, I, California, I know you have their, I don't know what's happening with the other issues, but in Pennsylvania, we had voter ID, just, just, just uh, the most strict in the nation, specifically designed to disenfranchise large numbers of people. We have the most aggressive gerrymandering in the nation, and there's a proposal to change how we um, award electoral votes because according to the prime sponsor and majority leader of the Pennsylvania Senate, Mitt Romney didn't get enough electoral votes and he's not happy about that. So we want to fix the system. So the, originally they wanted to do it by congressional districts, which they drew, which would have meant 13 to 5. Even though Obama won Pennsylvania by 5 or 6 points, it would have been 13 to 5. How, how did they get away with such egregious uh, d uh, distortions of democracy? How do they get away with it? Because they do it, and then it's done. And, you know, you could say, well, people will get mad and not vote for them, but the number of people who won't vote for them because of that is dwarfed by how, much, how many more votes they get by drawing a better district or by preventing African Americans from voting. Or, you know, in the case of the Electoral College, you know, no one, there's not going to be enough anger to prevent a 13 to 5 Republican win, <laughs> uh, you know because they've drawn the districts that way. So uh, they do a, calc a very cold-blooded calculation. We'll, you know, we may make some people mad. We may make the editorial writers of the New York Times go tut-tut at us. But at the end of the day, we're going to get all these votes. It's going to be awesome. And uh, that's how they do it. Uh, what can you do to raise Pennsylvania's uh, visibility as a state that has these political problems? Oh, well, I, I, I led the fight on... on Voter ID and the uh, and the electoral college thing. Um, I was one of the parties suing. We got we actually got the state redistricting struck down by a bipartisan Supreme Court for the first time in seventy years because it was so egregious. Um, but we, but no one challenged the congressional redistricting, and I didn't have standing to do that. Um, 
So I'm doing whatever I can. And I can tell you, if they try the Electoral College thing again, because let, let me just explain to your viewers how pernicious this is. Um, if they do, if they change the electoral vote, if the electoral college was submitted, was uh, selected the way they wanted it selected, which is by congressional district, this last election, Mitt Romney would be president elect, even though Barack Obama got five million more votes nationwide than Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney would be president elect. However, what they want to do, it's far worse than that, because that assumes that we did it by congressional district nationwide. They don't want to do it nationwide. They only want to do it in blue states. Okay, so for example, the Republican governors of Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Ohio, they all have proposals to change how we apportion the Electoral College to split it up. Uh, meanwhile, the Republican governor of, say, Texas has no interest in splitting up because Texas votes re re reliably Republican in presidential elections. He has no interest in splitting up uh, their electoral votes at all. So. Red states would still cast their electoral votes unanimously. Blue states would cast their electoral votes divided, um, which would make Democrats non-competitive in presidential elections uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, Sounds pretty nefarious. It, it is. I mean, uh, you know, look, and I don't mean to be hyperbolic here, but the reason to me that we're not Syria, that we're, we're not shooting each other in the streets over political disputes is because we all feel that no matter how bad things get, that I'll work really hard and next time my guy will get in. And if my guy gets in, it'll be better. And, and so we put our energy into winning the next election. Once that's no longer a viable option, uh, you know, the, I, I think that uh, loses its value as a safety valve for society. Uh, and people are, you know, are going to start looking for other ways because they know that they're, 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 the system is rigged. I think that, you know, we've got to find some people with a conscience who are like, I, you know, even if it benefits my party, I was not, I did not run for public office to rig elections and essentially end democracy. Uh, I ran, you know, to fight hard, but to have fair elections and and so forth. And and that that's what it's going to take. Because frankly, I mean, I can tell you in Pennsylvania. If the Republicans all support these proposals, they pass. They have the votes. And God knows the governor is not going to stand in their way. All right. Well, you'd stand in their way if you were governor. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you from uh, wherever the governor lives someday or, or from Washington. Now, and now you're, just, you're just scaring people, Mark. Okay. that's uh, no. <laughs> but, Thank you. I'm flattered. And, and in the meantime, I want to thank you for the work you're doing and for talking to us about it today uh, on Utopia News. Thank you so much.